Hello, Global Gardeners. It's Monday. It's gardening time. Let's get your gardening week started. Well, today we're going to be talking about bugs, insects, and most of what you'll see on YouTube and you'll read in blogs and see in documentaries even is how to control the insects in your garden. It's pest control, how to get rid of insects. Today, I want to take a slightly different slant. We'll be talking about those kind of things, pest control, but I want you to start thinking about pest acceptance, accepting the insects in your garden and maybe even encouraging more to occupy your garden. Getting to have that opportunity where you go outside and there are bugs everywhere. Because once you start recognizing the difference between the good bugs and the bad bugs, I just think it's a wonderful feeling to be in the garden surrounded by bugs and you're recognizing that just about all of them are the good ones. So we'll be talking more about the good bugs today than the bad bugs and we'll be answering your questions and we'll just be sharing our gardening stories back and forth. It's great to see a lot of the regulars. It's great to see River and Dale here on this Juneteenth holiday in the United States. And welcome to everyone around the world. Jean-Pierre is back from Belgium. So it's so fantastic. Tron is here from Vietnam. This truly is a global audience. So nice to have you all here. Do check in, especially if you're new. Let us know that you're new. We've got Jay and Heidi, our fantastic moderators, that will keep the conversation going and help answer questions if I can't get to your specific questions. So nice to to see everybody and here's a nice new name a tree every day Muhammad Ahmed nice to see you here hello to you as well and so uh, Tron for instance Tron's been a, a regular viewer for a long time and uh, always puts a comment in Vietnamese and thank you for that and I'll go back and and do a translate but I've also noticed uh, Jay and Heidi who are always on top of things uh, will often put a translation later on in the comments. So uh, just for those of you that may be wondering why we're speaking in multiple languages, it's because we're global, but I, I and others do make a point to translate when someone from uh, another country where English might not be a primary language is commenting in their native language. And I love that. I, I actually have learned so much about other regions of the world from doing that, from getting the comments and then doing the translation and finding out about a name for a plant or how a plant is being grown in some other part of the world that I just don't know about. So you all are fantastic. And the global aspect of this community is also incredible. So uh, ants and plants, enemies or friends. And I'm glad, glad you asked that because that's actually the number one thing on the list that I want to talk about today. And so I saw earlier Paul had commented that he had fire ants and had gone into the mound, dug out the middle, put in diatomaceous earth. That can work. You could use boiling water. That can work. So when we talk about ants, fire ants are... Even though they do positive things, they'll, they'll dig the tunnels into the soil so they'll help aerate the soil. They'll bring organic matter into the soil so it helps benefit and enrich the soil. For most people who live in regions that have fire ants, it's not a friend. It's an enemy and it is something that you have to battle. It is something that you have to try to deal with and boiling water, diatomaceous earth, are a couple things borax can work vinegar there's lots of ways to disrupt how they get into the garden but particularly fire ants chemical controls are often the best thing to use to try to get rid of fire ants so fire ants tend to be an enemy but the other ants the black ants the sugar ants the ants that are just crawling around I think they're friends. And that's why it was number one on my list today because of all of the insect pests that people ask me about, ants tend to be 
at the top or close to the top of the list because there's an assumption that that ants are enemies. They're bad. We need to get rid of them. And I let all my ants go. Even if they start digging into my beds and start making little mounds, their entrance and exit mounds, that's great. They're aerating my soil. They're giving a path for the oxygen and the water to get down deep into my soil. I've got terrible soil. But even in the enriched beds, they're mixing up all the organic matter. They're they're playing an important role in the garden. In rare cases, it happens, but in almost every case, ants will not eat your living plants. They may actually attack some of the smaller pests you have in the garden, and they help decompose a lot of that matter, including the dead bodies of the the insects that you you don't even really see, but they're there. So I think of ants as friends, and I do nothing to get rid of the ants in my garden. Now, granted, I don't have fire ants. I don't have those stinging, biting ants that if you happen to come across a fire ant, it's painful when they bite you. So I fully understand that. But that's, that's the general idea as we move forward today, that some of the insects that one gardener might see as a pest, another gardener might not. And, and I'm not saying either is the best approach. For me, the best approach is to let the insects live because as I've said in previous live streams, the predatory insects, those beneficial bugs that'll come in and take care of the pests, eat the pests, kill the pests, well, the bad bugs have to be there. That's a primary food for the good bugs. And so attaining that balance where you can just visit your garden and see all of those good bugs in action, uh, really, I think, is an indicator that nature is reaching a balance in your garden. And that's, that's a big reason why I wanted to talk about this subject today and not taking the approach assuming that a bug is a bad bug because most of them if you actually break it down statistically some of the studies that have been done when you start comparing the benefits of the good bugs and the bad bugs about half the bugs in our garden are neutral they're really not good or bad they might be food for something else uh, they they just are bugs in our garden but when it comes to that other 50 to 60 percent, the large majority of the insects you're going to see are classified as beneficial insects. Insects we might think of as pre uh, uh, of the pollinators, and there are a lot of bugs that pollinate that we don't think of as pollinators. Bees, of course, everybody knows a honeybee is a great pollinator. A bumblebee is a better pollinator. But there are flies, just generic flies, not the, the house fly that you got to swat on your windowsill, but flies of every size and shape and color that are just out flying. And they often are great pollinators as well. And that's why I say when you start learning and recognizing what the insects are, you'll see some of these benign insects. They're not causing any harm to your garden at all, but they're helping to pollinate your garden and in the process, feeding some of those other insects and other wildlife that might be in your garden. So uh, we'll proceed with that. Let's see what kind of questions we might have that have been popping up. Anita saying, what about little red spiders, friend or foe? Not too many per bed but enough to see them there. That's number two on my list is spiders. So uh, identification is key when we try to figure out if it's good or bad. Now, uh, I had a question like this recently and did a little correspondence with the viewer who was concerned about little red spiders on the plant. And my initial response was, Spiders are good in the garden and and let them be because they will eat and kill a lot of bad insects. And so be it webs or or tunnels 
or if they're just a like a wolf spider where they just are predatory and will will crawl after whatever the pest happens to be most spiders are good now i lived in oklahoma and we had brown recluse spiders which can really cause some damage if you get a bite they'll actually kill the skin and it can be a terrible wound but they don't hang out in the light and they don't hang out in plants a brown recluse the reason it's called a recluse is because it hides in the dark and in small places like in a closet of a house in the garden in oklahoma as many bugs as i had i never saw a brown recluse outside because it's just not the way the spider lives the same with the black widow spider the black widow spider if you get bit by one it can be very painful and you can have some problems but black widows don't make webs out in the bright sunlight between plants the spiders you see in your garden almost exclusively are not going to harm humans in any way they're going to harm a lot of insects but they're not going to harm humans and so in your question about little red spiders you have to make sure that it, it is a spider you're talking about because the viewer i was referring to was actually talking about spider mites and a mite is different than a spider but the mite spider mite looks like a little red spider and so they can cause damage and it's one of those things that that they kind of spin a little web it's little fibers on the leaves and that's why they're called spider not because they've got eight legs but because of where they live and they have this little webby material on the leaves spider mites can pose a problem to the plants bigger plants it's not that big a deal small plants yeah it can damage your plant so first off identify the insect is it a spider we're talking about or is it a spider mite we're talking about if it's a spider mite then you can spray it off you can rub it off you can use neem oil you could use diatomaceous earth there are lots of ways that you can you can try to deal with the spider mites if it's a spider i say leave it alone and and my my daughter kiri is is funny about this and she'll post things every now and then on the the membership channel page on on facebook because she makes a point to save every spider in her house and in her garden that that might be in a hazardous position and so if if there's a spider that is near a door or a spider that might be locked on or a spider that someone might swat she saves it and moves it to another area out of the way and hopefully it'll survive and so that I've, I've only taught her part of that she's developed that mindset on her own that spiders really do play an important role and we don't have many mosquitoes here in Colorado it's one of the benefits of our dry environment but I let spiders build webs in the corners near my windows because the few mosquitoes we get into the house are more likely to be caught by a spider than to bite me and give me a nice little red bump on the skin so same holds true outside if you live in an area with a lot of annoying insects like mosquitoes then let the spiders go crazy and they'll help reduce that population so uh, it's it's identification to start with spider or not spider and then you've got to make that decision for yourself spiders are creepy to some people I understand that and if you don't like spiders I get it you you can deal with spiders how you want but the spiders you see are really not the spiders to be worried about it's the spiders you can't see it's sticking your hand into that dark hole where a spider might be that's where you need to be more concerned I love seeing the the orb spiders I love seeing the wolf spiders I love seeing what they do out in the garden and it, it's just fantastic to actually learn about them and see what kind of life cycle they have and, uh, and they're a friend I, I considered spiders friends uh, yeah Heidi saying my husband saves all the spiders also and releases them outside and so I, I see nothing wrong with that I actually think it's great and so uh, Charmaine is saying is there a good mantis and a bad mantis 
<clears throat> and so this is a good question. And so mantids are indiscriminate. They, they eat insects. And, and depending on the type of mantid and depending on how big it is, they might actually eat small animals. And so uh, I don't have any that are that big. Mine are, are devoted to the garden and feed on the insects. And so this is one of those predatory insects that is both good and bad because they are indiscriminate and, and are in the garden. If they're sitting on a stem and you usually can't see them because they're, they're camouflaged, whatever color they are is where they're going to rest and wait for an insect. And so I've got both brown and green mantids in my garden. And it's incredible. In the dry, grassy areas, I'll see a brown praying mantis. And in the nice, green, lush vegetable garden, I'll find the green praying mantis. So I, I just think that part is fascinating as well. But if if a, a fly, if uh, you know one of those pests that we think of comes into the garden, they're going to eat it. But a lace wing that is beneficial, a predatory wasp that might be beneficial, they're going to eat it as well. So they don't think in terms of good bug or bad bug as they're catching it to them is just food and like i said earlier most of the insects in your garden are going to be neutral neither good or bad or good you you will have fewer bad bugs in your garden the type of insects that are going to be landing on the plants are more likely to be bad insects. They're landing on the plant to eat it or suck the sap out of it. And that's where the praying mantis is. So while a praying mantis could eat a good bug, because of where they are lying in wait, chances are the bugs are gonna be eating are bad bugs. So they're, they're neither good nor bad. It's just a question of, of what they're eating on the day, but in my experience, they tend to eat more of the, the pests than they do the beneficial insects. Either way, I love, that's another one of those, those insects that I love seeing in my garden. And, and it's, it's, it's a balance point. When the mantids arrive, it's like, okay, yes, they've discovered my garden because my garden is now a source of food for them. And nature is really creating the environment so that I don't have to use chemicals. I don't have to take extraordinary measures to get rid of the bad bugs. Nature is taking care of it myself or itself. So uh, that's, that's the way I look at it. And, and it really has worked out well for me. Hi, Marnie. This is my first time on live. My neighbor has an apple tree that is full of black spot and towering over my roses and cherry trees. Any advice on how to deal with it? And so, um, it, yeah, if it's got a black spot disease, uh, first off, they should probably be dealing with that. And that, that's a whole nother issue. Uh, pruning, cutting, using chemical controls. And, and depending on what the issue is, some of those diseases can spread to plants in your garden. So you might want to, uh, if it's hanging over, like hanging over a fence or uh, hanging over your particular bed, I, I don't like to interfere with my neighbors, but if their tree is interfering with my garden, then communicate with them first. But you might suggest that have them cut down some of those leaves or th those limbs, or you cut down those limbs, prune them out so that they don't pose a problem. Uh, but but uh, around here, at least, if any trees that are overhanging like rose bushes, you have issues where the tree might be shading the roses and the, now the roses don't do as well because they don't get enough sun. The leaves are falling in, in fall and they might actually pose a problem with some of the plants underneath. So there are lots of issues along those lines, but just, just communicate. Just talk uh, with your neighbor to see what you can do if you're thinking that you want the branch or branches removed. And that, that might be one way to approach it. Or help them out by identifying just exactly what the black spots are and if it's a disease or if it's insect damage 
uh, or if, if there's some other issue, find out what the specific problem is and then help them deal with that as, as a, a helpful gardener neighbor. That might be a good approach to take. So um, hope that helps a little bit. Uh, I, first thing, it's kind of like the insects that we're talking about today. The first thing, whenever something looks odd with a plant is identification, figuring out what the problem really is and whether it, it is a problem. And then you can decide how you want to approach the problem. If you can take care of it without chemicals or with chemicals, what, whatever the approach is that you want to take. And often with the insects, uh, ex with the exception of fire ants and a few others, I think most of the time you can take care of it without chemicals. And even diseases of plants or plants that have insect damage can be taken care of without the chemical control. But it's one of those things that uh, you have to be careful about. And so, yeah, this is this was the point I was making. Uh, Laurelful saying um, or asking, does cedar apple rust affect strawberries and can you spread it by giving away the strawberry plants? And so there are, I'm, I'm not sure about cedar apple rust, but there are a number of, of, of diseases and rusts that will actually work in two different plants. And often you'll need both plants. So you'll have a plant growing in your garden and then you'll have a tree and and this works with pests and diseases where, well, where they'll transfer back and forth and you can spread the disease by spreading either the tree or the, the plant back and forth. So uh, I'm not sure Laurelful specifically about cedar apple rust and strawberries, though I know that, that strawberries are susceptible to, to some of those problems. Um, but yes, if the strawberries are infected, and if you give those plants away, and if they grow in an area that, that, that is also susceptible, you could be spreading the disease. So uh, I, I would be careful about that. Um, I, uh, I, I, I've never had the cedar apple rust, and so I can't um, speak to that specifically. So appreciate that. Uh, Karen saying, my seed challenge is the sugar baby. They are transplanted out now. They will quickly. How much do you need to water these? So I actually have some uh, sugar baby melon seeds that I direct sowed. And uh, right now, I'm watering three times a day. Now, that's because my humidity has been between 8 and 15% for days. And again today, the wind is supposed to be 25 miles per hour. So for me... The wind and the low humidity is just drying out the soil in my Dutch Bowl garden beds so quickly that first thing in the morning, I've already done it this morning, first thing in the morning I go out and water all of my beds. And then in the heat of the day at about one or two o'clock, I'm out watering. And then last thing before I close up at night, I put a, a little bit of water so the, the soil is moist going through the evening. Now, I started from seed, so my seedlings are still very small, just an inch or two high in some cases. So I'm watering three times a day because I don't want the seedling to die from lack of water. If you've transplanted, if you actually started growing indoors, and so your plants are three or four inches high and a little more of a root system and maybe transplanted so the roots are already deeper than what I have with the seeds that I planted, then you can you can certainly get by, I'm guessing, with less than three times a day of watering. But the key is you have to check your own soil. Are you using mulch? How much mulch are you using? And so I like to start figuring all of this out by watering in the morning and then going out in the afternoon, three o'clock, four o'clock, and physically check the soil moisture. If the amount of water that you've given in the morning and the amount of mulch you have gives you a moist soil at four o'clock in the afternoon, then you only need to water once a day. If you go out at four o'clock and you check and see that the soil is dry, well, that means you're going to have to water twice a day. And, and that varies. You may not need to water twice a day on cloudy days. You may be able to go every other day. So when I first started 
the, the, the garden this year and I had some seeds and plants in before the heat and the low humidity hit, I was watering every two days for some of those, those seeds that I had started because it wasn't drying out as quickly. So you have to do your own check for your own beds in your own garden to figure out just exactly how much you need to water. The key with all melons and squashes and any fruiting plant is consistent moisture. So water as often as you need to water so that the, the soil is always moist because those fruits are going to need water constantly during their growth cycle. And so the soil needs to be constantly, consistently moist so that the plants can keep growing and give all that moisture to the fruit. So uh, check it out. Stick your finger in, dig a little hole, do whatever you want to do to figure out how wet your soil is later in the day. And that'll help you determine for sure just exactly uh, how much water you need to need to use. Uh, and so uh, this is actually um, number four on my list. Uh, Riverdale Gardens is asking lots of millipedes in a raised bed. The bed is doing just fine. Your thoughts. And so when it comes to millipedes, centipedes, mealybugs, beetles, for the most part, I just let them be. And they, they have a very important job in the garden. And so in recent weeks, I've talked about amending the soil. I've talked about using compost on top of the soil as a mulch. And, and I make a comment along the lines of, and it will break down and add nutrient, nutrients to the soil. Well, part of that statement and the reason it works is because of the millipedes and the centipedes and the mealybugs and the, the beetles. It's, it's those type of insects that are feeding on decomposing organic matter. They help all of that mulch that we put on the soil break down so that it can become usable for all of the soil organisms. So I, I occasionally see millipedes crawling around and that's great. Again, that's a sign of of a healthy garden. And usually I'll see more millipedes in the beds that I have the mulch on. So for the beds that I've just seeded and I don't have a thick mulch yet, I won't see millipedes in those beds. The other beds where I might have a thicker straw mulch, I'll pull aside the mulch and occasionally a millipede will crawl out. So start looking for those kind of indicators in your garden, again, thinking of the good bud bug, bad bug, a lot of those kind of insects you'll find in the areas of your garden where the matter is decaying and they're helping with that breakdown process. Sometimes with mealy bugs, we talked about this recently as well, they can become overwhelming and they might feed on young seedlings. But for the most part, all of those insects are are just going to be feeding on the organic matter or feeding on the other insects. And so um, centipedes uh, can actually be predatory, for instance. They'll actually seek out some of those other insects. And and the, the beetles fall into that category too. There's a lot of predatory beetles in your garden. It's all part of the process. It's all part of breaking down the organic matter and then decomposing the bodies of some of those insects and it's a nice healthy cycle when you see it so lots of millipedes in a raised bed i'm guessing you have a lot of mulch or your soil has a lot of organic rough organic matter in it and i think that's a good thing i i, I wouldn't be that concerned about uh, millipedes they're, they're not going to be biting you and causing issues now there's some regions of the world where you know you can get those centipedes that are two feet long and if they bite you it's hazardous so you know this doesn't hold true with every spot on the globe but for most of us in our gardens i wouldn't be too concerned about some of those insects that you're seeing they can probably actually do uh more benefit than than you can be surprised uh okay chief redbird i've enjoyed gardening for the challenge and fun of experimenting 
with different seeds and plants. Right now I'm watching my gourd grow only one seed out of the four in the package. You know, that's I like I like that idea because, uh, you know, I do a lot of that where where you 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 put four seeds in and only one germinates and start growing. And that one just becomes a special plant and you're watching every aspect of it. And and I just I love that as well. Uh, I, I did that actually with uh, some loofah gourds last year and uh, had had done some from uh, from seed indoors that I transplanted outdoors <coughs> and they were doing great. And then suddenly one day, three of the four were gone and some insect pest had come in and eaten the little seedlings. I'm guessing it was an insect pest. Um, it, it might have been a small animal. It's hard to tell. But but that one that was remaining, I paid extra special attention to. I was so glad that it was it was growing. And then I had a hailstorm that that bent it and killed it, and that was the end of it. So I know what you're talking about, where it you get down to a point where maybe only one out of four is is growing, and so you really want to take advantage of it and and be glad for that. So. Uh, so I want to go ahead and say uh, thank you to Yvonne Waters. Actually, I have to stick to this. Um, thank you for your help. Appreciate that super chat. What ants are dangerous for plants and flowers? And so um, uh, danger, there really aren't any dan ants that I'm aware of, at least in the United States, that are dangerous for plants and flowers. The concern is more how we look at them. So for instance, the peonies. My peonies are flowering right now. A couple weeks ago, they were covered with ants. And I have people ask occasionally, how do I get rid of all the ants on my peonies? And I saw something recently, um, a video talking about how you need the ants on your peonies because they're required to open up the bud for the flower to come out. No, that's not true. The, the peonies secrete a, a sweet solution. And so the ants are just feeding. They'll crawl up on the peonies. And, and just like you'll, you'll see that the ants are herding aphids because aphids will secrete a, a honeydew. It, it's a sweet substance that the, the ants feed on. And so Depending on how you look at it, there are some some who think that those ants are hazardous because they might be interfering with the flower or helping the flower. They might be helping the aphids and the aphids are harmful for plants. And again, I just see it all as a balance. If, if you have ants that are protecting the aphids, it's for the ants to feed on and those aphids will feed on your plants but you're still going to have the lace wings you're still going to have the ladybugs you're still going to have predatory wasps that will come in and feed on those aphids if the ants are there or at night when the aphids have gone to bed or when the ants have gone to bed and so you can think of that as hazardous where if you let ants go they might be protecting the aphids, which might be feeding on your plants, but I'm okay with that. If it reaches a point that there's too many aphids on the plant and the beneficial predatory insects aren't dealing with them enough or quickly enough, well, you can spray them all off and now you've dealt with the aphids or use diatomaceous earth. There's, there, there are other options you can use. And so, uh, the, the fire ants that can sting us or bite us and cause that painful welt are, are hazardous, uh, which is why I, I separate them out into that, that enemy or bad category. But the rest of the ants in the garden, um, I really wouldn't say they're dangerous at all for plants and flowers. It's just our own interpretation. And yeah, it, there might be more aphids because the ants are running off some of those predators because they want the honeydew. Uh, and, and I accept that. I know that leaves of my plants are going to be eaten at different times by different insects. I'm okay with that. It's just a question of how okay you are with 
your plants being eaten or portions of your plants being eaten and and hopefully that'll help you make your ultimate decision as to um, how to approach the ants in your garden in the first place so okay let's see scrolling down brian says I'm noticing black field ants on my loofah gourd i think they may play a role in pollinating oh yeah absolutely and so uh, as the ants are crawling back and forth all through all the flowers you know i was talking earlier about the soil but yes they can actually benefit the plants because they are pollinators as they're crawling from flower to flower on a plant uh, that they can definitely carry pollen with them. And so uh, if you get down really close, I've only seen it once or twice where I've seen the pollen actually sticking to an ant, but ants have little hairs on their body and those little hairs can actually pick up pollen as they're moving back and forth. So uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure about your specific black field ants, Brian, but yeah, that that's definitely a possibility. Uh, and, and I had a comment today or yesterday from a viewer who had noticed that on, on uh, the cucumber plants, I think it was, that there, there's no bees. She's not seeing the pollinators, but she has ants on her cucumbers and has already recognized that, that some of the cucumbers have been pollinated. Some of those female cucumber flowers were pollinated and are turning into cucumbers with no sign of any other pollinator except the ants that are crawling across the plant and so that you know the the, the basic idea of all of this is i just don't know enough i know quite a bit but i don't know enough about the role every insect plays for me to think that i judge that insect as a bad bug it may have a role in the garden that I'm just not aware of. Even if it's a, a, an insect that we think of as a pest, well, some of those pest insects are great pollinators. And so I, I like to think there's a role for every insect in the garden, which is why I try to strike that balance where the bad bugs will bring in the good bugs. But ultimately, that decision does come down to, to how you decide to, to approach it. So let's see, we have Cecil Gasper. I have a beetle-like bug that is green and called a true bug. It's eating my spinach and other plants. Uh, yeah, and so, you know, and, and this is one of those things that I do a lot of manual or mechanical control of the pests in the garden. And so when I come across uh, an insect that I know is eating my plants, I can see it happening. And if it's a big enough, uh, like, a, like a green beetle, if I can reach down and squish it or pluck it off or throw it into soapy water or whatever the approach is you might want to take, I'll do that. So yeah, don't get me wrong. I'm not against killing the bad bugs. And if I see the bad bug, I'm willing to kill it. My point is more just as a general approach to gardening that you can't kill every bad bug and so rather than spraying with with artificial compounds with those those chemicals that if they kill a bug they're indiscriminate in many cases as well they'll kill the good bugs along with the bad bugs so that's what i'm trying to avoid is uh the the indiscriminate killing by using a synthetic chemical pesticide uh, but if, if you can see the green bug, uh, the true bug, and pluck it off or deal with it, go for it. Yeah, I, I actually have no problem with that. But also, start paying attention to what else is happening because you may see birds and, and other insects come in and start dealing with some of those, those pests. A big reason why I'm okay with killing and squishing and plucking is I don't want an infestation. None of us do. And and often an infestation of, of insects, when it happens, just just can become overwhelming and stressful and, and you, all of your focus goes on trying to get rid of those bugs. If you can catch them early and there are just a few here or there, that's enough to attract some of those, those predatory insects. And so 
I try to avoid allowing any insect population reaching the point where it's infesting and killing my plants. I will take corrective action. And often a spray of the hose is enough to knock them off and, and deal with the problem. But in the very beginning, if I can identify it as a plant or an insect that's eating my plant, I'm okay with killing it. I am. So I know it's a bit of a dichotomy and I might sound like I'm contradicting myself, but, but there's a balance there. I don't kill everything. I don't kill indiscriminately and I don't kill a lot. It's, it, it's gotta be the, the bug of the day. And, and I like taking pictures. I, I, I came across one the other day and it's like, this, this looks like it's eating my plant. And then I looked closer and realized it was an assassin bug, which are really cool insects. And assassin bugs are predatory. And so, yeah, it's crawling over the leaf like it's about to eat the leaf, but it was obviously on the track, the scent of some other insect that was already on the plant, probably trying to eat the leaf. And so uh, it it's real easy when I'm not wearing my glasses in the garden and there's a bug to think, oh, that's a bad bug. I'm going to pluck it off and kill it. Be careful about that because sometimes some of those really ugly looking bugs are the most beneficial bugs. And those are the ones that you should leave behind Ginger Ninja Biscuit, nice to see you here, new to gardening, been watching for a while, love your channel, keep up the good work. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. I always like to have new gardeners and and uh, for, for, for new gardeners who discover my channel, a lot of you who have been watching for years and and, and, and I love the, the loyal viewers, you know that that I present my videos in a in a planned sequence, in a, a planned series, so that you can see how to do particular tasks from A to Z. Uh, container gardening, raised beds, fall gardening, garden planning, all those things I've got videos on. Uh, and so as a new gardener, thanks, welcome to the Gardener Scott channel, and I hope you can find a lot of the videos that you're looking for because I, I do have a lot of videos out there for new gardeners to figure out what what order to do things and how to do things and often what works best in the garden. So um, so Charmaine's asking, will green onion tops work to deter squash bugs? Um, not that I'm aware of. It, there are there are some plants uh, in the allium family, the 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 garlic and the onions that might deter some insects. Uh, it's more of a deterrence that the insects aren't going to eat them because those same chemical compounds that we find tasty, like in garlic and in onions, most insects don't find tasty. And so that's why onions and garlic have very few pests that will eat their leaves. That doesn't mean that those leaves are now a natural deterrence if you use them around other plants. And so squash bugs are not gonna be feeding on garlic. Squash bugs are going to be feeding on, on squash and cucurbits and, or bits. And so um, it's one of those things that you can have garlic planted around your cucumbers and your squashes, and you're still gonna have the squash bugs eat your plants, they'll just fly over or jump over or crawl through the garlic to get to the plant that they actually want to, to feed on. I've seen some studies, uh, some anecdotal information that if you make a, a spray using onions or garlic and spray that on the leaves of your plants, there might be some deterrence effect from those eating insects. Uh, but that washes off and dries off so quickly that it isn't a long lasting effect. So no, basically green onion tops uh, will deter the squash bugs from eating the onions, but it's really not going to work well to deter the squash bugs from eating the squashes. Hi Tay Tay, on my dad's tomato plant, the bottoms were rotting out before they were ripe. Is that an insect or disease? probably blossom end rot. And there's a whole bunch of stuff out there about blossom end rot. It happens on the blossom end, which is the bottom of the tomato on the plant. It's caused by a calcium deficiency. 
And so the plant, but particularly the fruit on tomatoes, they need calcium. Probably, most likely, the reason that your, your dad's tomato plant has that problem is inconsistent watering because almost every soil on the planet has enough calcium to grow tomato plants. But the soil needs to be moist, consistently moist, like we were talking about earlier with how many times you water a day. Right now I'm watering my young tomato plants twice a day. They don't need as much water as the seedlings, but I want that consistent moisture. I want the, the soil for the rest of the season to not be saturated, and to not be dry because when the fruit on the tomato plant is forming if the soil dries out or if the soil becomes so saturated that the roots stop working no calcium is being brought up into the plant and no calcium is making it to the fruit and blossom end rot will develop as a calcium deficiency indicator watering is the biggest reason for that too much or too little and i've got i've got lots of other mention of that in other videos because it is common but you know it's funny you may i've had this this question on these kind of things before i've had a few people over the years ask um i i should do a video on blossom end rot and i think I've, once or twice i had someone ask why i don't show videos about blossom end rot it's because i don't have blossom end rot in my garden it you know i i like to show you what's happening in my garden and what i have i don't like to use stock footage or steal from somebody else i'm definitely not going to do that and so i show you what's happening well by not showing you a blossom end rot video it's telling you that consistent watering works because i don't have blossom end rot on my tomatoes because I water as often as I need to so that the soil moisture is consistent. And then I never get blossom end rot. It's, it's that simple. So tell your, your, uh, your dad to think about how he's watering, check the way he's watering, try to be more consistent with his watering, and it won't go away in the tomatoes that already have it. Once it's set in, it's set in but it should not show up in the tomatoes to come after he figures out the consistent watering uh, level. And that should really make a big difference. Charles Stock is saying, bluebirds and tree swallow nest boxes in my garden and around my yard are full, and the bug count is down as witnessed by those that come by from local gardens in our area. Good for you. That, that's, that is a fantastic way or a fantastic approach to it. And so I've been talking about the predatory insects in particular. I've got my bird uh, boxes that I've built and put in my garden, and I see the same thing. Now, not all birds are insect feeders. Some birds are nut feeders. Uh, there are, are, are different types of birds. You can look at the, their bill. This is a whole other amazing way that you can tell what kind of bird or what the role of the bird is based on the shape of its bill. So there are a lot of birds in our garden that are not insect eaters. But during nesting time, it's about 90% of birds will be insect feeders for the fledglings, for the young birds. The parents will go out and catch insects and bring them back for the baby birds. So even the seed feeding birds will often catch insects during the nesting time. And yeah, yeah, you can definitely see a reduction in the number of insects in your garden when you have an in increase in the number of birds in your garden. And so if you focus on attracting those kind of birds that, that feed on insects, you can see a dramatic reduction. And the birds are a lot like the insects. You have to identify the bird and the role of the bird in your garden to determine if it's a good bird or a bad bird because so many people just automatically assume that the birds are going to eat all of their fruit or they're going to eat their tomatoes or they're going to poke holes into their squashes. Well, yes, there are some birds that do that, but most don't. 
and a lot of the ones that aren't going to be eating your fruit are going to be eating the insects in your garden. So um, great points, Charles. You can uh, definitely attract the, the beneficial birds and bluebirds. I love bluebirds and uh, the, the bluebirds that have been appearing in my garden recently are fantastic. And finches. I've been getting a lot of finches and finches will be eating the seeds. In fact, some finches have been eating the last of the seeds from uh, the, the plants that I allowed go to allowed to go to seed at the end of last year. And so uh, I'm not worried about finches or bluebirds eating any of my my tomatoes or squashes or fruits or any of the other things I'm growing because I love looking at them and they're going to be doing a lot more of the seed eating or the insect eating that's going to benefit. And a lot of the, the seeds that they're eating are weed seeds. So I got no problem with the birds eating the weed seeds. Uh, that that makes my job a little bit easier as well. So uh, I think that's that's a great thing to do is to encourage the birds to the garden. Uh, I, when I says, if you build it, they will come. It, it is, you know, it, I, uh, you may may have seen it or not, but I did a video, uh, it's been a couple years ago now, I think, where I built birdhouses. And in the next video, so I, I showed the video of how to make the bird house, hang the bird house, and the very next video I did in sequence had nothing to do with bird houses, but in the background of that video, you can see the birds flying in and out of those bird houses. And, and it was within a week. Within a week of me putting up those bird houses I built, there were birds living in those bird houses. So, so if you do it right, and that's what I talk about in that video, is, is, is you have to make the house for specific birds. And so I was trying to attract bluebirds and swallows, and sure enough, Bluebirds and swallows were occupying those birdhouses within a week. It, it's incredible. But I, I, I go back to some of those videos. Nowadays, I don't even think about it because I just see the birds flying in and out of the houses. Um, but when they were brand new, and I'll talk a little bit about this at the end. As you try something hoping it's going to work and you're not sure it's going to work. But then when you see it work, it, it's like, okay, yeah, I did it right. It worked the way it was supposed to work, and birdhouses definitely fall into that category. Hi, Diane. Just recently found lantern flies in the nymph stage. Interesting. In Pittsburgh, I read it is suggested to kill ASAP. Sorry if this has already been addressed. No, I haven't talked about um, lantern flies. Um, I'm, I'm not aware that we have those here in Colorado, but but this identifies that that whatever it is so if lantern flies are a problem in your area and if that's the the advice you're getting is to um, kill them asap then kill them asap um, by whatever method is recommended for the different pests that we have and it could be as simple as just um, using diatomaceous earth or neem oil or spraying them off or or killing them manually but if if that's the the advice that you're getting I'm okay with that, and and you should probably be okay with that as well, because if they're going to pose worse problems in the future, and you can take care of them easier as a nymph, then take care of them now rather than waiting for them to become adults. Often, adults can be harder to kill, and and then they'll lay eggs, and then you have a recurring problem. It's I talk about this with a lot of pests. Uh, if you can break the life cycle. Whatever the pest happens to be, you can often eliminate that pest from your garden. And so squash borers, there's a lot of those kind of squash pests that will live in the larval stage in the soil or in the stems of the plant as a nymph, depending on what kind of insect it is. And if you can disrupt the soil so that the grubs become uh, visible and now the birds eat the grubs or you can cut back the dead plant and throw it in your compost pile so that they don't overwinter and emerge as an adult you've broken the life cycle and you've helped to keep that pest from becoming a problem in your garden and so uh, this might be the situation with the lantern flies is take care of them now as a nymph and you'll probably see fewer issues in the future. And, and 
you know, again, there there are there are good and bad, and it's how we look at good and bad. So I, I did a video a while back as well about making bee hotels, taking logs and drilling holes and encouraging those solitary bees to come to your garden because you're giving them a home. Well, you have to be careful when you do that because one of the methods, I, I use logs and I drilled into the logs, so it's not an issue I'm concerned by, but bamboo sticks, rolled cardboard. There are a lot of, of bee hotels that you can buy to encourage the solitary bees. That's great. But there are wasps out there that will, will lay eggs inside those tubes. The, the wall of the tube is thin enough that they can actually stick their, their stinger. It's really not a stinger. It's a, it's a, the, the part on the female that they actually like burrow through the wall and then lay the egg and then that egg hatches and the larva grows and actually eats the bee larva inside those tubes. Point being, is that good or bad? It's you're, you want the bees and now this wasp comes and is killing some of your bees. Well, you can try to eradicate the wasp or just accept that that's part of nature because those wasps are also predatory and eating and being pollinators and doing all those other roles in the garden. So with the good is the bad and with the bad is the good and you just have to balance the role you want to play. And if you identify something on the bad part and you can deal with it, deal with it and and try not to be too concerned about it. Nini J, I have a couple of mulberry trees that sprang up a couple of years ago and it brings the birds in. That's great. There's enough berries for all of us, so I'm good with them eating and it helps keep the bugs away. There you go. Uh, because again, especially during the nesting time, those birds are probably eating a lot of the insects and you probably got more mulberries than you know what to do with. So I don't mind sharing that with the, the, um, uh, with the, the birds as well. And walking on sunshine, there are more bugs out there than I've ever heard of. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I like to learn about the insects in my garden and I, I try to keep track of what's there and <clears throat> I'm finding new stuff all the time. New insects, new species, um, new bees. The, in, in the um, description below, I have a, a, a link to my favorite books and one of my favorite books is about bees and some of those things that we think are flies are actually bees. And so the hundreds of species of bees that are probably near you that might be occupying your garden, it, it's just incredible. And most of the bees in our garden don't look like a honeybee. In fact, the only thing, the only bee that looks like a honeybee is a honeybee. And so, yes, there are way more bugs out there that, than you've ever even thought about. And when you take the time to start looking and focusing and learning, you can realize that there's some really cool bugs out there. Uh, I've been, salvia, I love my salvia flowers because they just attract so many uh, bees. And, and I've been waiting in the past, and I've mentioned this before, uh, there was one day on one of my salvias, I saw five different species of bees. And so I'm on the lookout. Right now I'm up to three. And so my salvias, recently have had three different types of bees on those flowers. And so I'm hoping that I can get to five or six or seven, and then I'll definitely be filming and you'll probably see that in a future video. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's so many species out there that we are just unaware of that it's mind boggling. Ladies garden at home. So glad to catch you today. I'm glad you're here. I took your advice and kept my brassicas covered in bug frost cloth most of the spring and no bug damage. The leaves look beautiful and I'm finally getting heads. Thank you. I, I'm so glad to hear that. Uh, yeah, I've talked about that in a couple uh, videos, one just, just a week ago where I talked about putting uh, a fabric over hoops over your young plants so that the bugs can't even get in. That's another, again, breaking the life cycle. If you have some of those pests, they're gonna come in and lay eggs and keep them out. Because especially for brassicas, 
You don't need pollinators for brassicas. You don't need pollinators for root vegetables. So go ahead and put a cover over those plants to keep the bugs out. And then you don't have to worry about it at all. You're not killing anything. And the bugs that are trying to get in are probably going to be eaten by a praying mantis or predatory wasp or a bird because they're confused. They can, they can smell your plant and they hang out on the fabric and something else comes along and eats them. So um, good for you. I'm glad you, you did that and I had, I'm glad you had success with it because uh, that's one of my favorite methods of, if, if I'm growing lettuce or, or broccoli or anything else that I want to look pretty, to serve, to eat, then that's that's one of the common things I do is just put the row cover fabric over it, protect them, and whenever it comes time to harvest, they look beautiful and it's all ready to go. So um, good for you. I think that's, that's fun. And Laura G. Young says shade cloth can keep bigger insects um, too. And, and so, yeah, and so a lot of it depends on the insect. Um, and the shade cloth, the row cover, the hail cloth, all of those can be used to, to keep insects and even those birds that might be eating the fruit. After the, the fruiting plants have been pollinated and the fruits are developing, you can do the same thing. You can cover and keep any of the insects that might eat the fruit or any of the birds that might eat the fruit away. So, so that barrier, that cover, uh, it is always a good idea. Let's go ahead and talk real quick about the background today. This comes from Richie Morris, and you've probably already figured out this is a little bit different than what we normally talk about. And so most of the pictures that we take are the daytime pictures when the flowers are pretty and we want to highlight what it is we're doing in the garden. But Richie has highlighted a nighttime view. And I just love this. And I've already started some projects along these lines. You, of course, you'll see those videos in, in the months ahead. But uh, I like getting out in my garden morning through evening. In a new garden like mine, where there are areas with no plants growing at nighttime, it's not much fun to be in an empty space and there's nothing. But in a garden where plants are actively growing, get out there at night because there are some amazing things that happen. I just saw this a couple nights ago. I was out in my garden after sunset and started seeing some of those moths that only come out at night. And so you've got some beautiful, you know, the sphinx moth, for instance, absolutely incredible. You've got a hummingbird moth that is huge. Now, granted, these moths are going to turn into caterpillars, and those caterpillars may be hazardous to your plants. But as long as they're moths, oh, they're so much fun to, to watch and to see their pollination action from flower to flower because you can actually grow flowers that, that flower at night. So I've got some, some moonflower vines that are just starting to grow. It's a white flower. They open up in the dark and it's for the moths it's really cool to start thinking about that as an area for you to expand your gardening experience if you haven't thought about it yet is grow a nighttime garden and while you're at it go ahead and put up some lights so a nice archway with lights around it and lights that are stretched around some of the the trellising in the background lights to spotlight some of the pots that you have like those those double wine barrels great idea to use the bottom barrel to support the top barrel so it comes up a little bit higher <clears throat> so um yeah take a couple of minutes to look at this nighttime picture the in in the background here you can see along the fence walkway lighting um, walkway lighting as well right here by this this little raised bed little wooden bed uh the in the in the background you can see these lights going above the fence line here uh i i, I just really like this idea the, the lights i i currently have i have some of these kind of lights in my front yard in the front landscape and and you can see those lights during the daytime in some of the videos that i shoot in my front yard um, but I haven't done a video like this in the backyard. 
the the projects that I'm doing right now are for a nighttime gardening video to come. But I just wanted to go ahead and just kind of plant this seed of future projects for you as well to think about what you can do to turn your garden into an inviting space once the sun goes down. And you see the chairs right here. And so imagine sitting in those chairs, you have, you know, flowers like petunias next to the chair. And you can go out on a nice, cool summer evening, enjoy a beverage, watch the moths that are flitting all over these petunias and the, the flowers. And uh, they'll, they'll go to the lights as well. And it's a great, great way to expand how you look at your garden. It's not just a daytime thing. It's not just a summer thing. You can get a lot out of your garden at different times of year and different times of the day. So thanks to Richie for sharing this with us. And maybe it'll give you some ideas of, of some things that, that you might want to try or start thinking about doing in your garden. Sunset Gazing says, I sit outside in the evening, watch the sunset and the birds, dragonflies, and bees really become active. Absolutely. For my yard being a blank slate to my planting, all kinds of trees and plants. Awesome. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. Just sitting outside and seeing some of those things that you don't normally see. And so um, your, your name says it all, Sunset Gazing, because it does open up an entirely different world. Yogi Lai says, I have a ridiculous amount of solar lights in the garden. Good for you. I think that's funny. And Lama Lama says, I only have the cheap little solar lights and I love it though. Uh, my husband calls it my little city. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's all I use is the, the cheap solar lights, but they work. And it really does make it into a completely different city at night. City for the insects and the birds and for you as well. So uh, that's great. I think that's that's wonderful. Uh, Jay is saying, I'm looking at adding arts and crafts to my veggie garden. There you go. This might be a project for you to think about, Jay, is maybe add some of those flowers, uh, those nighttime flowers or those sunset flowers and some lights to, to, to benefit it as well. So I, I, I think that's a, a, an interesting way to start approaching it. Um, and, and so, yeah, to the point that, that we were just talking about Urban Chicken Mama is... Uh, Depending on what you want, solar lights don't have to cost a lot. You can get those little cheap ones. And if they're, you know, like these little small ones, these little discs, you can actually pick up those discs pretty inexpensively and they just help light a pathway. Um, this one right here, I've got a couple like this that are, um, I've got one that's a dragonfly. This is green. The one I have, this is probably similar. The one I have is LED lights and they change color. So it's green and then it turns to yellow and then it turns to, to pink and then it turns to purple and then it turns to orange. And that little dragonfly LED light probably only costs $12, maybe even less. And so um, you, you can actually pick them up and they, they are cheap, they look cheap, but at night, you can't see that it's a cheap plastic. You just see the light. And uh, as the others have already pointed out, the cheap solar lights actually work pretty well. So yeah, Frank Barnwell is saying Christmas lights on December 26th are cheap and good outside. Absolutely. And so uh, I, I've done that as well. You know, pick up the, the clearance sale after the Christmas lights or after Christmas pick up some of those Christmas lights, outdoor Christmas lights, and you can use them in your garden as well. So that, that's a good suggestion. So Shandy's Garden just bought a bunch of solar color changing lights for the garden and installing them tonight. What a great coincidence. So uh, I'm glad you're doing that. Uh, and so um, Goof Damon's asking, but don't lights in the garden attract animals? So, so it depends on the animal. Um, most of the animals, at least I have around here, are coming in the dark. And so, you know, the, 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 the deer, uh, a, a lot of, you know, the, the groundhogs, the um, raccoons, you know, most of those animals you're not going to see because uh, they're nocturnal and they're coming in the dark. So 
the lights might be attracting moths and there might be some birds that might be more active because they'll be feeding on the moths. I've seen that too. Um, uh, but the lights themselves are rarely uh, bringing the animals in because most of those animals at nighttime are nocturnal and they're going in areas that there aren't any lights. You know, think of a bat. A bat is just flying around at, at light or at night and needs no light whatsoever. But if you're out there at sunset or shortly thereafter, you'll see the bats flying around that you wouldn't normally see if you weren't out in the garden at night. And so I, I wouldn't worry too much about um, animals that might be attracted by the light because if you have those animals in your area that are already coming to your garden, they're already coming to your garden. And in some cases, the light may actually deter them because they don't like to be in a well-lit area. So um, depending on the lights you're using, you might actually be able to use it to your advantage to keep some of those pesky animals away. And so, yeah, MW says I get deer all times of the day. Uh, it was that way at my last house. Here, the deer aren't out during the day. It, we're a busy enough neighborhood that they're not out during the day, but they come out at night because things quiet down and they can roam from yard to yard without um, being barked at by dogs because the dogs are usually in at night as well. Uh, so that's asking, I may have missed this, but is it good to have or not have a bird feeder to get some of the bad bugs? Um, so we, yeah, we did talk a little bit about this as far as encouraging the birds in your garden and the birds can eat some of the insects. And so a bird feeder is typically a seed feeder. And so the birds you're going to be attracting are seed eaters generally. And seed eaters are not always insect eaters. But during the nesting time, those seed eaters are probably going after the insects as well. And so uh, I think having the bird feeder is a great idea just to bring the birds to the garden but it, it varies. So you may see those, those birds from your bird feeder feed on the insects in spring and early summer, but they might not be feeding on insects later in the, the growing season because they're focused on, on the seeds. So um, different, different foods for different birds. But if, you're, if you've got a bird feeder, go ahead and do it. Bring the birds in. And at least at some times of the year, they'll be munching on some of the bad bugs as well. And and it might save you a little bit of effort on it. So, uh, and so, yeah, I covered this already, um, AB or AB. Um, it depends on the bird. Some birds eat fruits, most birds don't. And so you have to identify the birds in your landscape to determine, are they a seed eater? Are they an insect eater? Are they a fruit eater? It varies by bird. And what you do to either attract the bird or actually deter the bird will vary depending on what kind of bird it is. So I love bringing in the bluebirds and the finches um, and the hummingbirds because they're not posing problems in my garden. I'm not trying to bring in crows and I don't have a crow problem, but that's one of those kind of things. You have to identify crows will eat your crops, whereas a swallow won't. And, and that's the kind of thing you need to be aware of. Thanks, Carol, appreciate that super sticker. Thank you so much for being here today, and thank you for that contribution. I appreciate that. So, uh, yeah, and so uh, grackles, I, I'm, I, I'm in the mixed category for grackles. Grackles are a beautiful bird um, in the right light, but they can be a really ugly bird in the dark day, in days of winter. And so grackles are not among my favorite birds to attract because they're not a pretty bird. And I hate to admit, I like looking at the pretty birds, but I agree with you. I like having grackles in my garden because, I, same thing, I, I've seen the grackles go after those grasshoppers and munch away. And so the, the grackles in my area tend to travel in groups of six or eight, um, but yeah, they can come in they'll do a quick munch down of grasshoppers and move off on to someplace else. So I, I, I'm not sure what you can do to attract grackles. Um, I've seen some of them feed or, or like do some of the seeds around my bird feeders, 
but they just are popping back and forth and and it's not necessarily a bird I'm aware that you can attract easily. But yeah, I agree with you. They they eat grasshoppers and any bird that can eat a grasshopper is is a good bird in my category even if they they aren't. But if you catch them in the right light, as I say on the on the cloudy dark days of winter, they they look pretty dark and they look kind of um not pretty. But if you catch them in the right kind of light and they flutter down and they have this this green kind of more green than blue, uh, they really can be a really pretty bird. And especially when they're going after the grasshoppers, um, that makes them a really pretty bird. So uh, in interesting. I haven't actually seen grackles this season so far, so I'm wondering about that. Um, so let's see. I'm going to go ahead. Uh, Patty says cat birds are great at big catching and they love to bathe several times a day in the summer. Good. Cat birds are, are one of those interesting birds if you like to see the life cycle of the uh, of an interesting bird. Cat birds fall into that an interesting bird category. And so yeah, great mage gray wolf. Uh, they, they can just be, I've seen that happen before too, where they'll just pull up uh, seedlings Luckily for me, when I've seen that happen, they've been in an area where the seedlings or little plants are pulling up tend to be weeds. Um, I haven't had a problem in my garden beds, but yeah, they can be an issue. Uh, yeah, there's Laura. They have a beautiful iridescent sheen. There you go. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. It, it's an interesting bird. And uh, for Jay, they're bullies in the area. So, so you can see how e even the same bird in different areas has... Uh, different reaction from different people and sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad and so tiny blackbird with an orange spot on the arm yeah we've got those um those blackbirds red wing blackbirds and uh, beautiful and in fact a little park not too far from me it's about a five minute walk in the, the spring the trees are just covered with the red wing blackbirds and they're, they're beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And so that might be what it is that you, uh, that you see and something to, to look for. Oh, yeah, there we go. Charles says um, it's a red-winged blackbird. So thank you, Charles, for substantiating that. So I'm just trying to catch up on the, the, the comments. So I'm sorry if I'm repeating something that some of you have already said. And uh, I do appreciate you all being involved in the conversation and adding all that information as well. It's one of those kind of things that that you all help each other out as much as I try to help each other out. And uh, it, it's nice to have that. So thank you so much for all of that. And so, yeah, while I see it, Mayday Garden says the Red Winged Blackbirds have an unmistakable song. And that's, that's why I like to go down to that little park um, because there, there, there are hundreds for sure. And, and I think, uh, there's a, a little marshy area nearby. And so I think that's one of their local nesting areas because I've never seen them here in Colorado in, in those numbers, but yes, they've got a very unmistakable song. And when you have hundreds of them that are singing back and forth close to, or during the mating season, um, it, it's pretty incredible. So I, I think that's fantastic. So, um, okay, let's see. Bohemian Herbology Natural Solutions says join the YouTube chat specifically to participate in this phenomenal idea and such fun. So glad that you're here and so glad you're chatting with Heidi and Heidi is chatting with everybody else as well. So it's fantastic. Oh, there you go. Laura has a, is near a marsh and it's full of them as well. So, so there's some stuff that is universal and and that's that's why once you recognize what what different birds need and habitats and insects and all the rest of it you can see again how interconnected we are and we might have the same kind of birds but live in different areas but the environment that the bird needs is the same regardless of where we are so i think that's great james richter thank you for that thank you for my favorite part of monday well thank you this is my favorite part of monday as well so uh, I'm, I'm glad it can be for you too. This is one of those things that, uh, you know, this this time on Monday really does start my week off. I try to to take Sundays as a day off. Doesn't always work that way. You know how gardening is. 
but Mondays really are the, the, the jump start to the gardening week. And this is what I use to jump start that activity and to get out in the garden and do all those gardening things I want to do. So it's always so nice to have you all here on Mondays because it really does uh, make it out. So SP is wondering about cucumber beetles. Was it in an was it earlier in the vid? So um, I mentioned cucumber beetles briefly uh, or squash beetles, I think maybe more specifically earlier in this live stream. I have talked about them in a few other videos in the past. And so um, the cucumber bugs, the squash bugs, uh, those are those are the ones that that I would put into that category that my control of them is first to identify if they're even there. And as soon as I see them, those are the kind of ones that I'll pick off and squish and kill right off the bat. But but the life cycle is important to understand in a lot of, of the, the, the squash bugs and the cucumber bugs because most of them will overwinter either in the plant or in the soil. And so if you can identify the insect and then do a little bit of research and I figure out what the life cycle is, you might be able to break the life cycle by just putting a rope cover over some hoops to protect your plants. And then you won't have the problem ever again. And most insects are only going to be eating very specific plants. And so just because, you know, for instance, uh, the, the, the um, squash borers, you're not going to see them on your tomato vines. You're not going to, to see them on most of your plants. They are a squash borer. And so if you can keep them away from your squash, you can break their life cycle. And, and a lot of the squash and the cucumber insects will eat one or the other or both. And so the, the advice is to, to identify it specifically as to what it is, figure out the life cycle, figure out how you can break the life cycle. Now, this is looking into the future. This is so that next year you don't have that problem. In the short term, deal with it. If you see the eggs on the underside of the leaves, scrape off the legs, use eggs, use diatomaceous earth, kill the insect if you want to kill the insect, whatever your choice happens to be. Um, but, but look into specific insects a little more deeply and that might give you a better idea of exactly how to deal with that specific insect as a, as a way to deal with them. So uh, let's see. That, uh, let's go ahead uh, and I oh, appreciate that. You're very welcome. And let me see if I can find one last one. Laura G. Young says I get a lot of dragonflies due to the marsh and creek nearby, but it's still dry as a bone. Yeah, here in Colorado, it is still so dry. So uh, I did another water feature video that I just released over the weekend because I love the dragonflies and I and uh, and damselflies and they like water and I don't see a lot of them in my garden, but they're another indicator. When I see the dragonflies, it's telling me that I'm achieving a balance, that the water features in my garden are supplying that the, wa the water needs of some of the insects like that. And so I um, haven't seen a dragonfly yet this year because it's been very dry here in Colorado. But as I add more water features, and give the insects that, that water to drink, I'm hoping that I'll see the dragonflies start to show up because dragonflies can actually be very beneficial in your garden as well. So, uh, plus they're just really cool to look at and really, really cool to, to observe as, as they're flying around the garden and then you land, especially those really big ones. I think it's really cool. So, uh, and, and so at, as I talk about getting out in the garden and looking for the insects and observing what's happening and how often I'm watering, my, my young seedlings and the seeds that I planted. Um, I, I, I had a bit of a revelation this last week uh, just because things weren't happening the way I was expecting them to happen. And so I, I want to share with you that I have the same worries and the same concerns and the same stresses that all of you have as gardeners. Sure. I have been doing this a little bit longer than, than most of you, and sure, I've got more experience in a lot of gardening things, but I still have those same concerns. And so last year, 
I did a video on how to save cucumber seeds. And I saved the seeds, and those are the seeds I put into my garden this year. One, one bed in particular, Boston Pickling Cucumber Seeds. And didn't think a whole lot about it because everything I showed in that video I know to work. And none of my cucumbers are coming up. And it's like, did I do something wrong? No, I know I didn't do anything wrong, but why aren't my cucumbers growing? Why don't I have those little Boston Pickling cucumber seedlings? And, and I started doubting myself, which most of us do. We see something, we try something, we do something, it doesn't work, it's not happening. We start doubting ourselves. What did I do wrong? Well, as of about two days ago, I've got dozens of Boston Pickling cucumber seedlings growing in that bed. I just needed to have the patience that I always advise you all to have. And as I've mentioned recently, my soil has just been so cool, it's taken a long time to warm up. And so it just took longer for those cucumber seeds to germinate than what I was expecting. Because in past years, the cucumbers would germinate in four or five days. And these cucumbers, after a week, I still hadn't seen any seedlings emerge. And I was just getting so worried. What did I do wrong? Why isn't this happening? And the same thing with melons. In the same bed, I had a couple of melons. And it's like, it's been a week and a half. Why aren't my melons germinating? Was it a bad batch of seed? How could all of the seeds have been bad? Well, no. I just needed to have some patience to recognize I know what I'm doing and the seed knows what it's doing and I put the seed at the right depth and I've been keeping the soil moist and the sun is out. Finally, to warm the soil, it was that little variable. The soil just wasn't quite warm enough for the seeds to germinate at the rate that I was expecting. The seed had no problem all along. It was going to germinate when it was ready to germinate. It had been done correctly. And the seeds that I saved last year, I saved correctly. And I stored them correctly. I did everything right. But I doubted myself because it wasn't happening as fast as I thought it should happen. So yet again, another opportunity for me to say to you, just have patience. If it's something that you know is going to work, <clears throat> even if it's something new, that you strongly suspect is going to work, just have patience. Just accept what's going to happen. The seed is going to grow at the rate it wants to grow at. The plants are going to grow at the rate they are going to grow at. They're going to flower and fruit on their schedule, not your schedule. And that's something that we too often miss in this gardening journey of ours is we have our schedule of when we think things should be happening and when we expect them to be happening and when things aren't on schedule anymore that must mean something is wrong <coughs> well it isn't that it's wrong it's just that the plant schedule and the gardener schedule aren't matching so uh i i wanted to share that because i don't normally stress too much in the garden. I have confidence in my abilities. Even when I'm experimenting with something new, I have confidence that it's going to work out somewhere close to what I expect it to turn out. But it, when things don't turn out, there's that worry. I turn back into that brand new gardener thinking I did something wrong and trying to figure out what it was that's wrong and how I can fix it. And really, there's no fix needed at all. Just time, just patience, and the recognition that Mother Nature's schedule is Mother Nature's schedule. Mother Nature, you probably never got the memo from Mother Nature asking you what your input was, because it doesn't work that way. It's going to happen the way it's going to happen. And so try not to stress, try not to worry, especially as we move into the summer, and maybe the plants are getting too hot so the pollination isn't happening and you're wondering why you're not getting the fruit well 
probably has nothing to do with you. It could be purely weather related. There can be so many other things happening in the life of a plant and in the life of your garden that it's not something you did wrong. It's just those external factors, most of which we have no control over. So I'm very happy that my Boston pickling cucumbers are growing. I've got another project that you'll see. I'm growing pinto beans, same thing. Took forever for those pinto beans to germinate and start growing, and now they're popping up all over the place. So that, that's, that's a video I've been looking forward to doing for more than a year, and it's like, oh, it's not going to work out. I can't do this video because the pinto beans aren't growing. Well, they are. I just needed to have patience and remember that it's been cold. The soil's been cool, and the soil temperature affects how quickly germination happens. I know that I've told you that, but in the moment, in the garden, it's so easy to just default to the gardener being wrong. And I want to tell you, most of the time, you're not wrong. You're doing things right. I know I'm doing things right. It's just so nice when it actually does happen like you were hoping it would happen. Thanks for being here. I look forward to seeing you here next Monday. I appreciate you all so much. And you've really started my week off I'm headed out to the garden now. I hope you get to your garden soon. See you next Monday. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.